Good morning. My privilege to welcome you and to thank you for being here this morning. Aware of the fact that we have guests with us and we're delighted and honored that you're with us. We're going to ask you, everyone, to join with us in singing our opening hymn. Since the choir is not here this morning, or well, the mini choir is here. But since we, most of us know it, and the words are on the screen, I'm glad I'm a part of the family of God. Stand please and let's sing it together. good that's good now we usually have the choir to sing one and but they're not here this morning but Tyler's going to play it again and we'd like for you to just turn around and shake hands with one or greet one another and welcome them here and thank them for being here this morning The next hymn, the hymn being what it is, will you remain standing please? And we will sing it together. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. Thank you, thank you, and you may be seated. As indicated earlier, it is my privilege to welcome you this morning and to thank you for being here. When I talked to Margaret about the plans for today, she said, I have 10 members of my family that are coming. 
I said, Margaret, can you come back next Sunday also, Father? <laughs> but we're, I know we have visitors with us today, and we welcome you, and we thank you for being here. In fact, again, another comment that Margaret made, she said, I'm going to, uh, Dave Dempsey, is it Dave Dempsey? Steve Dempsey is going to be here. He's the sheriff. I said, my goodness, she expects us to get rowdy or something in there today, I guess. But he's here. Stand up, Steve, sheriff of uh, King George. Glad to have you this morning, sir. There are announcements in our church bulletin that I would call our people attend their attention to. The nominating committee tomorrow night at 7 o'clock, our prayer and praise time. On Wednesday evening, there is the little insert concerning Operation Inasmuch. These uh, ministry days on September the 23rd, many of you have been involved with it. And if you would be a volunteer this year, then we need to hear from you uh, very, very shortly along that particular line. <coughs> We usually, for those of you who are visiting, we usually recognize our, uh, our people with birthdays and anniversaries. If we can do that very quickly, even if you're visiting, we'll include you this morning. Birthdays over here. Yes. She had one yesterday. Did she mention her age? Did you mention your age? I'm not at the interstate. You're not the interstate yet. All right, on this side. That's good. Are you on the regular, <laughs> regular road yet? <laughs> In the balcony? Behind you, Donald. Behind me. My sister Gloria had one Thursday. Gloria Clark had a birthday Thursday. Anniversaries anywhere? Tyler, you're the man. As we come to our prayer time, uh, I've already asked Margaret if she will say something about this when she comes. We are aware of what went on in Charlottesville this past, uh, going on now, I guess, still, but yesterday especially. We are aware of conditions in our country. Uh, in your church bulletin, you'll notice that uh, Rosa Forrester is listed as an uh, patient at the hospital in Tappanic tomorrow because she was going to have uh, surgery, but that has been canceled, and so forget it for the time being. Forget that for the time. Don't forget Rosa, but forget that for the time being. And other needs I'm sure are represented here. I invite all of you to join me as we bow in prayer together. Father, it's good to be in your house today, and we count it a privilege to be here. We thank you, Lord, for the promise of your presence with us. And we pray that we will know that presence in a very, very special way. We pray for our country. We pray for our state. We pray for our communities. We pray for those who serve us in various capacities, from our first responders to, our, to those who serve in difficult situations, to our men and women in uniform, here in abroad, we stand in need of prayer. We thank you for those who serve us in places of government, including Margaret Hansen and others. Pray that you ransom, and we pray in a very, very special way for one and all. Lead us and guide us and bless us in this service today, and may it be a fitting witness and testimony to all involved. Our prayer is made in the name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen. Our music this morning is provided by a group that called themselves the Shades of Harmony. It's made up of uh, Gloria Clark and Linda Bowen and Michael Henson. If you can't remember what the real name is, just tell your friends you went to the Baptist church and they had a shady group that sang Sunday. <laughs> And so Shady Harmon is going to sing. <laughs> Thank you. 
invite you to join us in the singing of our next hymn. It talks about the solid rock on which we need to stand. May we stand and sing it together, please. As we share in giving this morning, Mike will lead us in our prayer. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and each and every blessing that you've given us. We pray for the families of the ones that were lost in Charlottesville. We pray that the people of this nation will remember that this nation was founded, one nation under God, and that we would turn to such. As we give you our tithes and offerings, we ask you to bless the gift and the giver. In Jesus' name, amen.
before the message from uh, Margaret, the Shades of Harmony will sing again. <coughs> Thank you, thank you, Shades of Harmony. I believe it was three years ago that we decided during the month of August here at the church we would have what we call the Lighthouse Project. The Lighthouse Project, the emphasis behind it, the theory behind it, is that there are people in our various communities who have a story to tell and they're letting their lights shine for the Lord wherever they may be. Margaret, we do not just invite politicians. In fact, you're the second one we've had and your neighbor, Mr. Whitman, was the other one. But we invite people who have something to share with us about their journey with the Lord. I want to say this, Margaret. You're not here this morning because you're a politician and in the House of Delegates. It was triggered by a letter that you wrote to the pastors uh, throughout your district, I assume, wherein you began with, and I can't quote the statement, but you began by saying that in the position in which you find yourself, you rely upon the Lord for guidance and direction and his blessing. Amen. And I accepted your testimony, got in contact with you, and you agreed to come. 
Her husband, Todd, and the children, stand up please, they're here. Todd and Bevin and Morgan, they're here this morning. Thank you for coming. We were glad to have you. Do you really have 10 members of your family here? They are my family. Oh, they're your family, even the, huh, the in-laws and the outlaws and all of them? Yeah, okay, but we're glad to have all of them. This your first visit to Cobb Park Baptist Church? No, I come here for the hunts on the line. <laughs> <laughs> the hunters have a, a meeting here once a year, and she comes here for that. But this is your first time here to be with the service for us, with us. On behalf of that, Margaret, I introduce you to the Cobb Park family, and I want you to give her a welcome in being here this morning, please. <laughs> Bowen called me last night just to make sure that I was still coming because he, he heard that I was on crutches. Um, I lost my crutch, but I still have a little limp. But I did tell him last night, I said, I, I feel guilty because of the events in Charlottesville yesterday. So I have to address that first um, and make sure that you all know what happened Friday night and yesterday does not reflect Virginia at all. Does, those, those folks that, that came to our state um, were, were from out of state. They do not reflect who we are as Virginians. They do not reflect what we believe as Virginians. Um, as, as I said, they were outside of the state. Um, they were not there to pro protest that monument. Um, they had different uh, ideas and it was building up over over months. Um, they came there with a pre, with premeditated intentions. Now that this investigation is going on, so um, I think all of our, our hearts are are filled with um, trying to understand what in the world was going on with these people and what was in their minds. But I think just to to get it um, to get started this morning, I'd like to start with prayer, if you don't mind. So let's bow our heads. Lord, we are faced with difficulties in the state and nation. Please allow the love of our country and our founding principles to guide us. Lord, guide us with your wisdom and love. Allow our hearts and our minds to open and hear you and trust you. Please help our leaders realize your power and recognize that they are your servants in serving the people of this great nation. Lord, we are coming to you in prayer this morning seeking guidance for the young generation and other states so they understand these extremist violent rallies do not reflect Virginia beliefs. Lord, we pray for law enforcement. They are always on the front line. These cowardly acts, they do not reflect what we believe. Lord, we pray for the victims' families and ask that you comfort them. Lord, thank you for hearing our prayers. Thank you for our blessings. It is in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Pastor Bowen, thank you for inviting me. I made a list of books that I like to read, sort of my go-to books. And I think Angie made a list. I don't know where that list is going to be, maybe in her office. So I'm going to put that behind me as well. I also brought some gifts this morning from a dear friend of mine, Terry Beatley, just published a book. Um, I have three, so maybe we can share those around. I also brought some other gifts from the Family Foundation. They're up there as well. My speech is about an hour long. I'm joking. I'm just joking. 25 minutes. Good morning. As Pastor Bowen said, he called after receiving a letter about votes I had taken protecting families. And he asked if I would speak about how my faith in her works within my political career. And I thought, oh dear. I know that I speak a lot. You see me out in public, and um, I'm always discussing policy and community issues. But I will tell you, I do not like talking about myself. That is something I don't like doing. I can talk, I can talk you blue in the face, but I don't like talking about myself. So I went home, and I talked to Todd about this. And he said, Margaret, you know, this really isn't about you. This is not about you. He said, you're going to be a messenger for God. I said, okay, you're exactly right. 
Like you all, I'm living this incredible journey filled with life events that generated my faith in him and life events where my trust in him has offered guidance. I'm certain many of you will relate to some of these experiences that I'm going to share with you today. They may be similar, but I also pray that you find strength, compassion, and wisdom to build on your own faith from the words that I share. That being said, I'm so thankful for your phone call to share this story of how my faith evolved from personal experience, but also from the amazing people that I have been so blessed to cross paths with in my life so far. So here it goes, what God has done for me. He established roots of faith very early on in my life. He never deserted me. He taught me the value of a strong marriage. He taught me the value of serving other people. He surrounded me with very faithful people. He proved that prayer works, and he always provides. I was raised in the church, christened right after birth in Kinsale at Carmel Methodist Church, and that's still my church today. My family committed me to the Lord. My church family also committed themselves to raise me as a Christian. That family continues to stand with me through each major life event, graduation, marriage, births, deaths, ups and downs. Sunday school was very important. I'm from a family of five girls and I have no earthly idea how my mother did it. No idea. We were there every Sunday in dresses, we were clean and we all had bows in our hair. <laughs> my Sunday school teachers were Virginia Luthie and Betty Mae Hayes. I loved Sunday school, I loved Bible school, and every single summer the songs were the same. This old light of mine, I've got peace like a river, I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. And he's got the whole world in his hands. Young minds, young children, they're so beautiful and it's so important to teach them and encourage them early on, establish their faith early. Some of my church family are here today and um, I didn't know that um, some, of, some of them are part of your congregation now. And uh, one of them also raised me, babysat me. Don't tell any of the stories of the things I did. <laughs> um, I know I tried your patience. I know I veered away. But uh, you saw that little light was still down there flickering somewhere. And um, there was a light of hope shining. And I'm so thankful for you. I'm so thankful for my family because you established the roots of that faith while I was young, and I would not be the person that I am today without you. I'm thankful for God for always watching over me. Right after high school, I attended Virginia Wesleyan College for two years studying child psychology. I withdrew from college after a serious car accident so I could heal from surgeries and I was closer to my family. But that also began a downturn for my life. A series of losses in my family and a shocking loss of a very close friend to me. He was like a brother. He suffered with a life-threatening disease, but while here, he loved his life so much. Every picture of him was smiling. He was awesome. He loved hanging out with his friends and having fun. He loved his family, he loved music, and he really loved to eat. I remember searching for answers and comfort. First, it was through prayer. His mother was amazing during this time, and she still is amazing. His friends and my friends and family were incredible. This was a rock bottom, but it was also a healing point at the same time. I remember pulling out my Bible, and it was very, very dusty, very dusty. I began researching scriptures for comfort after death, scriptures that would help me heal, and I remember how wonderful it felt to pray and feeling that it was received, and over time, healing was occurring. It was uplifting and positive, and I was so thankful because opportunities started to come my way. I began selling flooring and blinds and working in a gift shop, and I was loving life. I was working again, and I started to date, and I soon met my husband. We lived here in Warsaw, in Pinehurst, and I was so thankful for God's comfort. Prayer works, God heals, and he never abandoned me. 
my love, my husband Todd, he encouraged me to finish my degree. While he worked, nine years after leaving college the first time, I re-entered part-time at Randolph-Macon, taking summer classes and J-term classes so that I could finish in two years. And while Todd worked, I drove to Ashland every day and completed my degree in child psychology, and I had a minor in religion. And I joke now, I use that degree every day of my life because you cannot be in politics and not have a degree in child psychology. <laughs> Should be a pre-requirement. Three days after I graduated, we found out we were expecting our first child. It was a surprise and a blessing. We didn't find out if we were having a boy or a girl, but the night she, Morgan, was born, my family and my church family, we loaded the hospital up. Our careers thrived. We were blessed, and we were very busy. In 2005, we moved closer to my work in Kinsale, and we found out we were expecting our second child. And this pregnancy was a little more difficult during the second trimester. And six months pregnant, I had a seizure and fell. During the examination, the test showed uh, positive results for trisomy 17, which was going to be a fatal disease for our baby. We were determined we were going to carry that baby full term. And the following weeks consisted of amnios and ultrasounds. And weeks later, after a lot of prayer and stress and trust in the Lord, our son was born, Bevan. He was perfect. He was perfect. The tests were showing false positives. Maybe it was a reaction to medicine. The endurance we had in our marriage to rely on our faith was incredible. We shared fear and pain. This was a point that we had to comfort each other. We prayed a lot together and we thanked God because we were very blessed at the end. A strong marriage is unselfish. And today we continue to worship and pray together. We rely on each other to make it work. <laughs> Todd and I are very independent. We're very confident, and he is supportive of my career, and it keeps me away from home a lot, and I support him. He stays at home a lot with his <laughs> career. Now, when we disagree, and we do, I'm up here, I can say this. I'm always right. His parents taught him to say, yes, honey. <laughs> He's always calm, and he never gives up on me, even the most frustrating situations. He's incredible and has taught me perseverance. And we're still working on me being calm. God has blessed me with an amazing husband where a marriage continues to grow on friendship, fun, talks, and our faith together. John chapter 20, verse 20 says, My prayer is not for them alone. I pray for those who believe in me through their message together that all of them be one. After Bevan was born, the next few years, we grew our careers, raised our toddlers, worked through preschool and diapers and so forth. I was approached to run for office. And with my family and community support and blessing, we began to enter the arena of public service. A dear friend and mentor, Apostle Bivens, said to me, Margaret, you keep God and family first. Don't you ever let anything come before that in your life. So I keep those boundaries very well guarded. And this service has been an honor for me. The ability to change, reform, and stop bad ideas have made a difference locally, but with your help, and it's been awesome. I said earlier, this is a message for God. I truly believe in being a servant leader. If you know me, and you've ever followed my legislation, they are pieces that I call homegrown. And what that means is, I always ask, why do we need this? How is it going to change someone's life? And what's the problem we're trying to fix? You will see my legislation comes from the people I've met, businesses in need, and current issues of concern. While mild-mannered, there's a very protective side of me when it comes to my family and my home. And when I'm in Richmond, you are my home, 
and you are my family. I once had a volunteer tell me, Margaret, you're like a pit bull in sheepskin. <laughs> I've met incredible people during my service that grew my relationship with God. They've strengthened my confidence, and they've worked with me to do great things for Virginia, and they have changed many lives. While campaigning early on in 2010, I had the honor of meeting the Dempsey family, a family that has served our Commonwealth their entire life. Sheriff Dempsey, highly respected in law enforcement across the state, highly respected in the criminal justice community and the courts, highly respected in our capital. He is also my go-to when I have a question regarding anything related to criminal activity. A Christian family spent his life protecting others, making sure they're safe in the community. His family lost their loved ones instantly in a car accident. They were young and they were beautiful. I never met his surviving daughter, Christine, but when we did, boy, does she have energy, and she's here today. We introduced her to Drive Smart Virginia at the state level, and what a mission from there. This family continues to cherish their loved ones by saving lives. They partner with schools in Drive Smart Virginia while promoting their own organization, Three Ribbons, Three Reasons that focuses on distracted driving and the impact of losing loved ones. This incredible act of courage and faith is a lesson for all. This family has been effective in sharing their story of loss and making a connection with the young generation regarding the seriousness, the serious consequence of texting while driving, but other ways you can become distracted. They are heroes to me and an example of forgiveness and commitment to a cause. The memories of Bethany Dempsey, Lauren White, and Abby Cullen continue by saving lives through the mission inspired by their own family. It's an incredible story and continues. They are an inspiration for an, us all, and it was an act of God. Another incredible story is Amy Hardy. She was losing her son to cancer at the time, and she came to Richmond to fight major pharmaceutical companies, insurance companies, and hospitals that provide experimental treatments for terminal diseases that were withholding treatment. Amy's testimony in front of committees in Richmond against the huge attorney seemed scripted, but it was sent from God. Those bills were hard fought, and in Virginia, in 2015, we passed a law that allows experimental treatment and trials without FDA approval for patients with life-threatening illnesses. Virginia was one of the first in the country to pass legislation with the help of Amy's testimony. Since then, 37 states have joined, and the new administration in Washington expressed support to fast-track the FDA process for terminal patients, with the U.S. Senate already passing a bill. This is monumental for terminally ill patients and their treatment. In Virginia, we call this the Josh Hardy Bill, and he will say li save lives. In Memphis, Amy makes sure patients have a room to feel comfortable like he was in the Ronald McDonald House. She is another person that grew my faith. She constantly thanked God, even through her troubles, willing to help others, realizing her blessings. I spoke with her yesterday about this visit, and her response was she was grateful God used Josh for her glory. There are so many other people I could stand here all day and name the business leaders, the teachers, the parents, the veterans, and all of the incredibly hardworking people of the Northern Neck that have inspired me to serve you. I named a couple because they have spiritually brought me closer to God and changed so many lives, not just in Virginia, but across the nation. My journey of faith continues. I continue to meet new people that strengthen my relationship, but today especially was helpful because I realized how much God has changed my life. I had to think about these experiences. I had to write them out. I had to speak them, and I'm so thankful. The song this morning, Stand Up for God, Stand Up for Jesus, I enjoy standing up for God and glorifying him. 
Many people will say that there's a separation of church and state. I totally disagree with that. This nation was built on the Christian faith. General assemblies, even today, we pray as a group before we begin to vote. And we need to continue to do that. And I would ask that if God has worked through you, be vocal about that. It's not a time in this nation to be a silent Christian. In Richmond, I'm very vocal about my faith in God and my positions on moral values. That being said, I always ask for churches, organizations, uh, students, groups, families, friends, whomever, to come and visit the Capitol and watch us during session. It's important to see history in the making, and you matter. You matter more than anybody else walking those halls in Richmond. And don't forget that those grounds belong to you and I. They do not belong to Richmond. They belong to you and I. We pay for that. The process is fast, but it's very interesting. If there's a particular subject that you enjoy, whether it's banking, business, education, the Chesapeake Bay, public safety, I will let, make sure, I'll make sure that you get into one of those committees. But in closing, thank you for having me this morning. Thank you for inviting me so that we can glorify God. Um, he is amazing. He works through all of us in different ways. And this has been a complete honor for me. And I'm so glad that Todd helped me make the decision to be here. And um, I did stress about it a little bit. And I was very nervous. But it, it has been amazing. And, and I'm thankful. God bless. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you. We need more like you in Richmond and Washington and elsewhere. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Uh, you mentioned Josh Harding's mother. Pardon? Amy. Yeah, Amy is her name. She was invited to be one of our speakers for our, for our Lighthouse this year. She said, I cannot come during the month of August, but I'll be glad to come to your church and talk and tell you about. This is the lady that lost the, whose son had cancer for a number of years and he died. And we heard her do the funeral for her own son. And it was upon that basis that she was invited. Next Sunday, Reggie, are you going to bring 10 members of the family? Wow. Probably. <laughs> right, right. Reggie Brand will do the, our uh, Lighthouse project next Sunday. Uh, he and Sharon will provide the music. Uh, they have a grandson, and ever so often we have, when the need arises, we have a dedication service, and by choice and by preference, we're going to do that next Sunday also. Uh, I hope to have you home by at least four o'clock that day. For, uh, <laughs> not really. We'll get there, right, Reggie? <laughs> we'll get there. And then on the fourth Sunday in the month, Dr. Irina Chandler who is also a Westmoreland uh, resident, will be here to share with us. Irina went with us on our trip to Israel this past January, and I've heard her story, I know her, and she will be here on the last Sunday of the month. But we're glad you're here today. Margaret, I'm gonna, usually I go over there and stand and the people come by and tell me how great the sermon was. <laughs> and I question that sometimes, especially when they've slept through it, you know. Maybe that's what they meant, you know. It was great to get a nap here this morning or something like that. Todd, based on what she said, do you mind standing beside her? The children, I'll leave the option up to them whether they stand there or not. But we're glad you're here this morning. I'm glad uh, I'm glad you were here to hear the story. I did not know Margaret that well. But when I read the letter in which she affirmed her faith and her testimony, 
that was room enough for me. That said, we're going to sing our closing hymn, More Love to Thee, O Christ. Let me say, Margaret, we do not pick our hymns out by, just by throwing a hat up in the air, but when you mentioned the fact of standing up for Jesus, I thought of the fact that in the political world today, in the business world, in every world, we need those willing to stand up for the Lord. So let's stand and sing it together as we conclude our service this morning. I failed to mention the fact that Reggie is going to do the service next Sunday because he's been on the air in this community for 34 years, every Sunday morning, telling of what's going on in our churches, playing gospel music and all of that. You'll want to hear him. Uh, not only him, but he and Sharon as well. Margaret, Todd, can we have you please, sir? If anybody puts any money in your hand, you're supposed to put it in the basket. <laughs> <laughs> Let us bow for our closing prayer, please. Father, it's good to have been in your house today to hear the story of Margaret and Todd and the family and to be blessed by it. And we pray, Lord, for all who represent us in the halls of Congress here in the state and on a national level, and we pray that you will give us men and women who will have a testimony such as we've heard from Margaret Ransom this morning. We make our prayer, as always, with thanksgiving. And everybody in the house said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. You are dismissed. <laughs>